So the last section of this chapter is all about conservation, which is the protection and maintenance of biodiversity. It just basically talks about how we want to protect the habitats and ecosystem around us. And also keyword here, trying our best to prevent the extinction of species. Now, extinction of species will happen regardless of human activities or not. However, we have to be aware that the presence of humans on Earth, the things that we do on Earth, can sometimes accelerate the extinction of many important species as well. Endangered species basically means that the species has the population has fallen to dangerous levels and if we don't do anything about it, they will become extinct, which means to say they cease to exist. What causes this to happen? Very simple. We have things like um, we have things like excessive hunting by humans, loss of habitats of the creatures or plants, climate change where they are unable to adapt to the changing environment, alien species. Now, alien species is not, you know, ET, extraterrestrial things. Uh, alien species or invasive species are just a species that moves into a new area and competes with the local species. As an example, the python, which is a particular large snake, is found in the region of Southeast Asia. It's endemic or local to that area. However, what happened was they were imported into the United States uh, as pets. Now, the problem here is when they were brought to the United States, they may have escaped and when they escaped, they started eating the local birds in that area. So when they start eating the local birds in the area, and the python did not have a natural predator, so there's nothing to eat or control the population of the pythons in the United States. So the python is referred to as the alien species. Right. Another case over here was in Australia. In Europe, when the European colonists went to Australia, they also brought rabbits for a source of meat and fur. But the issue there then is the rabbits escaped and started to proliferate and multiply at alarming levels. And they started to eat the plants in the area, which caused huge problems back then. So the rabbits became the alien species or the invasive species in Australia. So these are some issues that we have to be careful with because when they become alien species, they will affect the local species in that area. Now, why do we have to protect and maintain biodiversity? They love asking these questions usually. So there are many answers that you can give for this. So there are about seven answers, I think, if you look at your textbook or you can go online and check it out. But the first one is the moral and ethical reason. The important thing is uh, moral and ethical reason is because we are aware of the damage we do. We as humans, we are self-aware to the fact that we are present on Earth and we understand that we are causing damage to the environment. So we have a responsibility to try to mitigate or reduce it. Right. The second reason, if you are more capitalist, all right, and the first reason doesn't appeal to you, then consider the second reason, the economic reason. Plants, especially, are source of drugs and medicine. Not just plants, by the way, but a lot of things can be a source of drugs, medicine, or gene tech. As an example, penicillium is not a plant, but it's a fungi, uh, but they actually produce antibiotics, which is the penicillin antibiotics. Uh, that particular to, uh, plant, which is in the middle, is referred to as the foxglove. You don't have to memorize it, but that foxglove was the backbone of producing a particular chemical known as digitalis, which acts as a wonderful heart medication. And another one, we also have this, uh, this bacteria known as Thermus aquaticus. And Thermus aquaticus was where we derived the enzyme tech polymerase, which was using gene tech, PCR. So the point I'm trying to say here is as follows. I'm saying that there are things in nature that should be protected, that should be conserved because they do benefit humans on the long run as well, because they aid in technology to improve our lives. Now, another economic reason that you can put in is ecotourism, national parks and coral reef areas. If you were to visit places like Malaysia, we are 
we are known for our tropical jungles. Like our tropical jungles are pretty good. Um, you can also climb uh, towards East Malaysia. You can also climb Mount Kinabalu. There's also the Nia Caves. Um, for West Malaysia or Peninsular Malaysia, we actually have quite a fair bit of nice mountain ranges and tropical forests for you to track. I had the privilege to travel to the one in Annapurna in Nepal. One of the most beautiful things I've ever done in my life. And when you hike in the Himalayas, you're paying quite a fair bit of money to trek in these areas. And the money is used to help the local community and also aid in the conservation projects in that area as well. So the point is, nature is a source of tourism. People love to come to different places to look at nature. For example, off the coast of a particular place in East Malaysia called Samburna, you will be able to access the island Sipadan, where it's one of the most beautiful places in the world to do snorkeling or even scuba diving. So, uh, other reasons are environmental reasons. For example, we need forests, for example, tropical forests to absorb CO2 to reduce greenhouse effect. Transpiration from trees will humidify the air, will make the air full of moisture and also reduce the temperatures in that area. Aesthetic is quite an interesting one because we should also protect the environment because it does help with aesthetic and beauty reasons. Now, Nature is a source of inspiration for the artists. For example, if you're a writer, if you're a painter, if you're a poet, if you're a fashion designer, if you are a person who likes to uh, do animation, one of the biggest things that I explain is Finding Nemo. I'm sure you all know about this animation, this movie. Finding Nemo derives its inspiration by observing creatures in reef ecosystems, the clownfish, the sea anemone, the jellyfish. Of course, you know, that's implying that Dory is always forgetful, but you know, that's just artistic creativity. But otherwise, the reason why the movie is good is not just because, you know, it's good, it's like a good story, but it's realistic. It is quite realistic with its, okay, uh, putting aside the talking fish, but um, the fact that how the fish moves, how the eel moves, how the manta ray moves, how the migration of the turtles, they actually do paint a picture of what is happening in the reef ecosystems. Uh, fashion designers also take inspiration from deep sea creatures like this. And also, if you notice the one on the right side, they have taken inspiration from, obviously, the peacock. We also have, for example, inspiration from the lotus flower. Uh, the lotus flower is something that is beautiful, that has always been uh, associated with Buddha. Because Buddha is always depicted uh, meditating on the lotus flower. The allegory or the symbolism here is the fact that the lotus flower is something that grows in murky waters, um, very muddy or sometimes even dirty water. But as it comes out and sees the light, which is the sunlight, it will bloom into something beautiful, which is sort of the message that Buddhism is trying to convey. Like at the I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm going to bastardize this to the... <laughs> I'm really going to bastardize this because I'm not the best when it comes to Buddhism. But the point is, when the lotus blooms, it represents overcoming the obstacles or the problems in our lives and achieving a kind of nirvana. So yeah, so it became a source of inspiration for artists and even symbolism as well. Please do not underestimate the power of nature when it comes to inspiring you. Another reason is ecological reasons to protect food chains and food webs. For example, we have the kelp forest. The kelp is sort of kelp is sort of like an algae or seaweed, by the way. I guess you can say it's a plant and they live in the waters, all right? And the kelp forest is a very important habitat for many creatures. Uh, also, things to absorb carbon dioxide from the water so that they can reduce the amount of CO2 in the water, preventing acidification. Problem with the kelp forest is sometimes sea urchins, yes, these spiky things, uh, will eat up the kelp forest and decimate the entire habitat. And that's a problem. 
So we need something to reduce the sea urchin populations. And that comes from our good friends over here, the otters. So the point of the matter over here is we have to protect otters no matter what. All right, otters first. Okay, no, not otters first, but you know, otters important. So by protecting the otter population, you are able to control the sea urchin population, which will help to protect the kelp forest. It prevents the kelp forest from degrading or from being destroyed. So these are some of the reasons why we would want to conserve, protect and maintain the biodiversity in our areas.